Let's talk about artificially generated images. Practically all students are learning about and using AI right now, whether that be ChatGPT, Snapchat, Midjourney, Dolly, Microsoft Office, or soon even Google Docs. They're gonna be using AI at school and at work. So today we're gonna to explore the ethics of all of this. And specifically, we're gonna consider the biases and ethical considerations of AI generated art. And when I say AI ethics, I'm referring to a field of study and practice concerned with the moral principles and guidelines that govern the responsible development, deployment, and use of artificial intelligence systems. Throughout 2022 and 2023, the chat AI platform, ChatGPT, has really skyrocketed. It's had remarkable growth and advancement. Many folks are hearing about it and using it. And alongside that, there's been major improvement in image generative software like Midjourney and Dolly. There's passable as real images. Some are not as much as others, but many of them are. Uh, and they can mimic the styles of various artists over thousands of years. And we have to consider how we can problematize that because there are a lot of issues with AI image generation. It's not perfect. And we need to examine the dangers of using this with a, a critical look on how it's being used. So image models like Midjourney, Dolly, are trained through a process called supervised learning. During training, the model is presented with images along with a corresponding description that enables it to understand the relationship between what people are looking for and what image should be outputted. And through a series of mathematical equations and really complicated code, training enables artificial intelligence models to generalize its understanding of images and then do various different things, such as image recognition, object detection, it can blend images together, it can even transfer artistic styles. So let's take the example of training AI to recognize different species of flowers. The training process would begin with thousands to even millions of labeled images with different flowers accompanied by a description. The images could include different angles of flowers, lighting conditions, different backgrounds with flowers, to ensure that the model understands various different poses and settings of flowers. So here we have an image of a cherry blossom in Nagawa, Japan. We have bulbs of just an unidentified blue flower in Sydney, and then just some pink flowers at nighttime. AI models rely on descriptions that were set by whoever uploaded the file. And because we're working with hundreds of thousands of files, they're typically skimmed off the internet. That process happens hundreds of thousands of times with any objects labeled as flowers. As the training progresses over multiple iterations, the model is going to fine tune itself. It's going to learn to distinguish the differences between different flower species, and it's going to capture what it truly means to be a flower. It's going to repeatedly expose itself to diverse examples. It's going to adjust parameters. It's going to figure out what's right and what's wrong, and it's going to be able to classify flowers fairly accurately. And that's done in part by a ton of users who are using the software who are either essentially upvoting or downvoting whether or not the software is doing well or not doing well with specific generated resources. So here's what those images might roughly look like as AI with some really basic descriptions. So here's an image of cherry blossoms close up during the day. Uh, a generated image of some blue flower balls. I wasn't really sure how to describe the last one, so it's a little bit off, but it's relatively similar. And then some pink flowers at nighttime. And you can see that they're relatively similar, especially considering one is completely made up using AI. And once we've trained this thing, we can also simultaneously be training it in a variety of other concepts. We can classify new, unseen, stylized, or morphed images by combining flowers with various other things that it's also learning at rapid rates. So for example, here is a tattoo piece based off that cherry blossom idea. So the AI learn about what tattoos look like when they're applied through various different tattoos and combine it with the idea of cherry blossoms. Here we have some blue flower bulbs, same idea, but it's in the style of Japanese artist Takashi Murakami. It's incorporating like his little eyes and stuff into the piece by examining his art as well as the flower art. And then finally, we have an image here of just rainbow alien flowers. It's just stylizing a bunch of different ideas together to try its best to guess what I mean when it's sampling, you know, millions upon millions of images all together. And some things to consider at this point might include, you know, where are they finding these images? Something that we'll need to initially problematize is how are the images sourced? Are they copywritten sources? I would venture to guess that most of Takashi Murakami's art is copywritten. Is it ethical to say that I'm going to generate art based off an artist who, um, well, one is making money from this, but also perhaps they've passed away. And then we're making art from either like an estate or they can't create that anymore. Um, very similar to the debates surrounding Michael Jackson performing as a hologram in, in years past, whether or not that's ethical. 
Another thing to consider as well is who is labeling these things and where are AI images actually sourced from? Um, a lot of these images are sourced from social media websites like Reddit. And because people often are stereotype biased, uh, perhaps just ignorant or unaware of what they're labeling, uh, sometimes it might not label the correct things. And there's also limitations in general to generating art. And we'll explore that here in a second um, because it can be highly problematic. And really this just leads us right into the major topic, which is the training data used to train these image generation models could contain biases. They could reflect societal stereotypes. If the training data set is predominantly relying on biased or unrepresentative images, the model may learn and perpetuate those biases when it generates new images. Dr. Meredith Broussard, she's a data journalist and author of More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech, wrote that tech is racist and sexist and ableist because the world is so. Computers just reflect the existing reality and suggest that things will stay the same, which builds us into thinking more critically about technology and the rampant growing use of AI. The choices that programmers make about AI contribute to the stereotyping, the input and instructions that are provided to the model, the way it's coded, the way the filtering works, the way it selects generated images, those can introduce or amplify biases, especially if they're not approached with care and awareness. According to Career Explorer, 72% of programmers are male and 49% are white, which is quite substantial considering that only 8% of programmers identify as Hispanic and 6% identify as black. Because of this discrepancy and because there's a lack of diverse representation, as well as uh, many different software companies have actually fired folks for being AI ethicists, there's not a lot of oversight here. AI image generation has been criticized for perpetuating stereotypes um, and many problematic behaviors. And please note that biases are a fact of life. I'm not trying to say that biases are unrealistic or that somehow we're going to eliminate all biases from the world using artificial intelligence, but we need to be taking a critical lens at this. Categorizing people is how humans organize our world. It's how we process an incredibly complex society. Everyone holds biases in, in some way. That said, biases are also how we quickly create stereotypes which could lead to prejudice and discrimination. Counteracting those biases requires knowledge of how stereotypes are perpetuated, recognizing when they exist and then changing that narrative. AI, because it's fed images from the real world, it doesn't have a critical understanding of bias and many of the programmers don't as well. It just tends to reinforce dominant and potentially harmful stereotypes. And we're gonna look at this with an example. So we're gonna use the software Dolly. Um, you could use Midjourney as well, but sadly Midjourney uses Discord and Discord's blocked in a lot of school and work networks. So it's a little bit harder to use, especially in a classroom setting. So for using Dolly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go on the website and make a free account. And in this example, uh, I'm going to use a prompt of just a, a general thing. In this case, I'm going to use engineer. Uh, and you can see here, when I generate an engineer, it does give me a specific type of individual, uh, not, necessarily, not necessarily a diverse individual, not necessarily a representative version of an individual, but a very specific stereotype of what it means to be an engineer. Let's take that even a step further. I'm gonna task folks, here's a prompt list. If you wanna pause the video, you can. Go on Dolly and try generating images based off any one of these things. And feel free to like combine different things from different columns, combine things in the same column. For example, what typically pops up if we search for podcaster? What typically pops up if we search for housekeeper? And even more so, perhaps even more problematically, if we look over here in that right column, who is a working class family? What is a first date? Who's a bad student versus a great student? What does poverty look like? And see what types of images pop up. Again, I encourage you to pause right here and then we'll go over it. So as we look at these different prompts, we wanna consider what do we notice and what do we wonder? Why do we think things are generated in this way and what problems does that have when it comes to the use of AI technologies both at work and in school? And what we would do is we'd essentially just look at some of these. So check out, for example, here is an image of a housekeeper as we said before. And you can see that housekeepers are generally classified as being of certain race, certain gender, uh, it's perpetuating that narrative. We move into that second column, a typical golfer, seen as a certain, again, gender and race. 
a basketball player, again, a certain gender and race. And again, I, I see it as most problematic, not that the other things are not, but if we move into that third column, here is a typical first date. Here's a great student versus a bad student. Here is a happy community versus a dangerous community. And note, I added a couple more words in there to make it generate some people. When we think about things in this manner and we look at what's going on, it helps us consider the claim that AI ethicists make that image generation software has the capacity to cause harm. And folks will agree or disagree on whether or not this is simply reflecting the world as it already exists and these things are already there. So what difference does it make? And some people will say that the, the arms race of AI and the rate at which new images are produced is going to change the way at which people view uh, gender, racial, uh, class norms, what have you, whatever they might be, whatever stereotypes might exist. And there are things that people do in the world beyond artificial intelligence to counteract this. You have people that work, for example, on marketing boards to ensure that their product is advertising to a diverse market, to ensure that it's not just perpetuating a certain stereotype. Uh, our media is frequently showcasing the fact that um, these stereotypes exist and they work to counteract them. And there literally are AI ethicists that do this work to work in AI, but many of them are being fired, laid off, you know, etc. So in a classroom setting, you could take this exact same activity, have people work in partners or small groups and have a very thorough discussion about the ethics of this, with the idea being the next time that someone uses one of these AI softwares for you know some reason and they're looking something up, they're going to think slightly differently about what it is that they're doing and how they're using it. In the exact same way that if I access a Wikipedia article for more information, I'm going to be a little skeptical of the information I first see problematize it, use a critical lens, and adjust as needed. So thank you for listening. You can check out this lesson in the show notes.